Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 16. Is it 16 of Tactical Crouch? Is that what we're on already, or is it 15? It's 16, right? It's 16. I have no idea. I just checked. Sideshow, I don't expect idea. you to know. Nice. We've, we've got a very uh, exciting episode. We had, the last four weeks, we spent 75 minutes e each week going through our top 20, or not our top 20, but our, our power rankings for Overwatch League Season 2. And now we are finally... At the point to where we can bring in uh, another big brain, Sideshow. Who, big fat brain. Big fat brain right there <laughs> coming in, sharing his power Very rankings wrinkled. with us, talk about some other competitive Overwatch <laughs> stuff. Sideshow, I think we've only talked in person, spoke in person twice. I've interviewed there you, you like six times, six times, but four of those have all been recordings for Overwatch League Daily. There you go. Okay. Well, most people don't make it past the first interaction with me. They, they choose to avoid me after that. So two in-person interactions is pretty good. I mean, I'm also surprised about your strategy this time. I only know that you already are drunk when we start podcasting and not you're getting drunk while we're podcasting. I... What's the difference? What's the di it's, all, it's all just a spectrum. It's all a spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> it's unreal to me that to this day nobody really seems to have caught up on that one episode oh, of this I was just this. thinking about that I remember when you guys filmed that he comes into the discord he's like dude Sideshow I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember which I'm episode I'm like what does that so... even mean <laughs> yeah. he's like he was just having a blast dude <laughs> yeah yeah I think I'd come in off a night out and decided to do a podcast with you because that was when the time zones aligned. But no, I'm just... No, just no it was... It was... It was you were misreading your calendar. You were like, oh yeah, there is no meeting today. <laughs> so, But our podcast time was 1 a.m. on the other day. You were like, oh, damn! And then you that Ubered from, from the... Uh, from the restaurant or wherever you were back to the studio and we made that the podcast. I and you got... Prog progressively more sober as the episode went on. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, progressively more boring. <laughs> and tired, falling asleep at the end. Very possible. All right. Well, I mean, Sideshow, thank you for being here. I'm really excited about, we've got, after we did our, our topics, um, last week, Sideshow's like, hey, I've got my top 20. If you wouldn't mind me coming on the show, you guys can roast me live. And I was just like, F yeah, we're going to do that absolutely that's gonna happen so we did it we're here we're gonna do it before we do though a couple of housekeeping things just really quick download the show everywhere itunes spotify google Podcasts. ever search for tactical crouch or search for overwatch league daily they're on the same feeds you'll find them on the same things the best way to support the show is what you're doing right now listening to it and watching it however if you want to do more Sub to the channel, uh, donations, anything like that helps get us new equipment, keep the podcast running, pay for internet bills, podcast hosting, all that stuff. And next week we have a special episode with none other than head coach of the LA Gladiators, David D. Pay Pay, coming in talking about some different Overwatch League uh, topics. So it's going to be really exciting. We've been talking, I've been talking with David for a few weeks. Every week after a tactical crouch, he's like, Hey, I really like this episode. Here's what I liked about it. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, what are we going to get you on the show, man? He's like, I'd love to come on. So he's going to be on next week. All that's going to be going happening, but we do need to discuss some actual overwatch news. And well, did you see did you actually see Depay's tweet recently where he was it. talking about managing expectations? Yeah, yeah. Like, what was up with that? That was Someone was directing serving. everyone's rankings. Direct, that was yeah. directly after a conversation he and I had on Discord, believe it or not. Yeah, and yeah. He goes, I think, he goes, thank you for having us so high, but wow, we are really high. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, because coming into the season, I don't think anyone really rated the LA Gladiators last season, right? They no. had like... I remix and Bishu on the team it was like the tank line that just looked so strange. And then they went mm. through this marvelous improvement. And now everyone is kind of assuming that the positives have carried over. And so I can just, I'm just imagining a scenario. I don't know whether this is true, but like a, a universe in which 
everything has gone wrong behind the scenes for the LA Gladiators. Things have just fallen to pieces, and he's like, oh my god, everyone's expecting us to win. What is going on here? Like, we're just pieces everywhere. I still think they'll be really good. I've got them high in my rankings, but it would be a, a strange universe in which he, uh, he has to manage the expectations for everyone and try and push them down quite a lot. It's kind of a good problem to have, though. It is a good problem to yeah. have, yeah. Like, hey, everyone thinks that we're going to do well. and then just Yeah, know. I mean, that was a problem that Dallas had last season as well. And so. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They good problems at the beginning well, of the season. They didn't yeah, yeah. Of, no, no head coaches were being like, guys, top five, Dallas, top five. No, that's, temper your expectations. They were like, we're number one. We're going to be number one. So... Mm -hmm. A uh, little bit different this time. Let's let's do this. Let's talk. Let's talk about uh, NA contenders though. This last week. So this last week we had the wonderful conclusion of NA contenders season three. And surprise, surprise! Fusion University walks away their third contenders season in a row in a four to two win over Atlanta Academy. Sideshow, did you get to get to watch uh, this? Yeah, this yeah, I watched the I watched the whole series. I thought it was um, a good series, actually. I, I, I there were a lot of mistakes from both of the teams, honestly, in terms of how they were playing the like their fundamentals normally were pretty good, but then there were key moments that both teams would kind of throw it away. Fusion University just occasionally clutch because their players are so good, and then sometimes Atlanta uh, threw it away. But at the end of the series, Atlanta completely collapsed. I think they did really so well bad. keeping it close to 2-2. And then, unfortunately, was it Hanamura where they should have won and ended up only drawing, yeah. I think? Yeah. With the and then from there, from there, they just went like, straight downwards. But it's awesome that there are teams that are able to kind of go, at least for a moment, toe-to-toe -to -toe with Fusion University with much lower individual skill than what we'd expect uh, a team to be able to do. So props to Atlanta, I think. Yeah, I, they, I mean, I they got full held, though, in the last two maps, which was really surprising. Yeah, I think that, like, weird sim comp. Everybody, that was really surprising. But, you know, to, to take uh, Fusion University, who I would say is arguably the, easily the powerhouse in NA contenders right now, obviously, um, being number one three seasons in a row, hard to argue with that. It, it was just really surprising for me to see them stay so close and then just completely unravel so quickly. <coughs> it, was yeah. just, it was just a little weird. It looked like nerves, honestly, as well. I think this is the, the kind of mental stuff that Fusion's players don't struggle with and Atlanta's really did. I mean, maybe it's overplayed at this point, but the support line for Atlanta was a clear problem in that game. I don't think they're a problem overall. I don't think Ajax and Dogman are normally as bad as they played in that final, but... Some of Dogman's transcend well, most of Dogman's transcendences actually were really poorly timed. Ajax died a ton of times when he had beat. It was almost, I mean, it became a meme, right? It just yeah. he, he kept dying with them, and that's the kind. When that gets in your head, then you just get full held. So, I think it was totally a mental thing from them. They also strike me as players that feed off of energy that is going out, and if you then lose one of those close series, it can be deflating to just the, the mood, and then. Also, long finals don't tend to work for these types of players. Like, we had it in Co with Cox in the Epic Season 2 finals, for instance. It's yeah. just like playing high energy over several hours is very hard. Yeah, it's not something you're kind of used to playing through the regular season. You play, like, you know, a best of five, a four game set a day, and then you call it quits. Like, yeah, you practice behind the scenes, but are you practicing for a best of seven? Are you practicing for all eight games? Is that something you take into consideration? I don't know. And yeah, it, it did look like it, it wore on them, and it kind of looked like Fusion was prepared. And, and they kind of uh, read the situation well. You know, you saw them on Hollywood come out with the, uh, the one tick grab with the Symmetra comp. Like, you can that was say super that, strange. You can say that that's planned all along, and you've got this big brain composition. But like at the end of the day, that that's like a morale killer. That's that's something that absolutely puts you in the ground when when you lose to Symmetra with this weird comp that you've never practiced. You hit the curveball. It's that's got to kill you. Mm, yeah, I'd expect the morale to have already been crushed by being full held at the beginning. Oh, of the sure, morale. exactly. Yeah. Like the sim just grabbed a tick, didn't it? I mean, they were actually close to throwing that away as well. The weird thing is, Fusion University are easily the best team in North America, but the, some of the ways that they take these fights suggest that they're really not as prepared or, or as dominant or like as our level, our ready as some people make them out to be. There were a lot of weird decision making um, 
errors, sir, I think, that came out from them. Sir, you haven't seen those Overwatch League teams. And I think some <laughs> of those true. Overwatch League teams are getting beaten convincingly in scripts as well. Yeah. I can imagine, I can imagine. I, you know, I like to keep this uh, perhaps non-realistic, you know, utopia in my head of what our level should mean, where it's like, you know, the plays are working well, things are working, the, there's a level of consistency and discipline and uh, individual skill, but you're quite right. When I think our level, I'm really thinking like the top five teams from last yeah. No, top seven yeah, teams well, from last like the team. bar that you kind of expect from an Overwatch League team, not that they necessarily hit that bar. But yes, I mean, it, if a team, if, if when we said our level or like elite or whatever word we use to describe tier one, if that, if it, if it was like you had to be as good as Shanghai Dragons, that's literally the point I was about to make. It's like that was not a good team, and yeah. so if you use that as the bar, that's a very poor bar. That's like a, that's a a bar that's scraping the ground, <laughs> scraping under the ground. Yeah, dug a dug a hole for us. <laughs> it's a bar that's a shovel at that point. Let's, uh, so, I mean, anything else on the NA contenders? I don't think that this was necessarily surprising. Kind of cool for, you know, a expansion team's contenders squad to go so deep into it, uh, which is, you know, kind of fun, but at the end of the day, it's kind of just labels at this point. But, uh, yeah, any other thoughts on this before we, we hop on into some of this XL2 controversy? I guess we we can say a word about Europe as well because it happened also oh, yeah, last week, right? That's a region too. Yeah. That's a yeah. region too. Look, like Tripod is the normal viewer for contenders. And you see that in the viewership numbers. It's it's like, oh yeah, that's on right now. To nice. be fair, I am not I am not the the best contenders viewer. So I am I am very much a hypocrite to be making competitive Overwatch content for how much contenders that I watched these last <laughs> four months i mean there is a lot right now right it's like oh yeah still not finished korea's coming up it's okay. yeah but yeah the, the series in eu was actually okay so on the risk of running being biased because we have friends with the hurricane staff it seemed to me that hurricane was probably the second best team in europe uh, simply from the play but yeah the final itself was quite entertaining also i have to say there are a couple of standout players on that giganti squad where i'm still confused why for instance someone like Devin doesn't get the call up oh. and I, maybe i will, will make some content around this but that turns like the the conversation about age there gets pretty radical like a lot of the those coaches i asked simply said 23 is too old to take a chance on and that is crazy for an eSport. Yeah, I, it beggars belief, honestly, that Damon hasn't been picked up. I think it's a combination of not many opportunities for European players to come into the league because people, you know, there aren't that many mixed rosters that actually um, were created for these expansion teams. A lot of people wanted to focus around Korea or Chengdu picked up uh, Chinese. And then also there was... Uh, other players that are arguably better than him when you really boil it down to there are only a set amount of open slots but uh, he is our level like he could play on one of these teams and be mm. excellent and i disagree massively with the idea that using just a random cutoff of 23 is too old that's a real nonsense unless you're a team that feels they are not picking players up for now but only picking them up for like three years down the road which nobody's picking up like a random guy out of um out of contenders and then signing them to like a four-year contract so they at least get you know what they consider his peak at the three years down the line it's it doesn't make sense to me like it, pick him up see how he is i don't think he's going to dip within the next couple of years you should still get a decent amount of time out of him there's no evidence to suggest that overwatch league is uh, purely a young man's game like yes there's a lot of great young talent but the game's too young to be able to say like it, you drop off after a couple of years you have to wait until an esports been around for at least a few before you're making decision making like that yeah it's not quite dynasty level yet right you're not building dynasties uh -huh. off of young players you're looking for a couple of good seasons even from uh older players i mean what the longest contract you can get in overwatch league is technically three years now yeah, I got two plus one. Yeah, so it's 
yeah, it's it's definitely something where you de- you definitely don't need to be just getting the young talent. And we saw, I mean, if if season one is anything to tell us about how season two might go, a lot of stuff changes uh, with these with these rosters. Then again, we probably aren't going to see eight new expansion teams, so we probably aren't going to see as much uh, movement and new signings when there's so many more players needing to be signed. But still, this is definitely one of those things where... Um, mm, do you ever just start a, a sentence? You, you know the Michael Scott thing. Oh, very often. The Michael Scott <laughs> thing. Often. You start it, and you're, you're yeah. gonna fin- you're con- you are absolutely you're intent on finishing that sentence and making it make sense, and nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just leave it halfway. Leave the mystery. Leave the enigma of what yeah. perhaps you might have. Been. That's what happens. Just na- label it art. That's what happens. <laughs> let, the, let the chat's imagination just take it and and imagine. You know. I'm well, trying, to, I'm trying of, to keep up with Sideshow over there, and it's, it's clearly <laughs> not working well. On the topic of young players, though, and going back to Fusion University, I think they're the only team that's really doing academy teams properly. I yes. think they've picked up players that are too young to go into OWL so that they can develop them for like a year, some of them two years or uh, you know a number of seasons so that they have a lot of experience. They can move them up into the Fusion team and they seem to have picked up players that they would want to move up into the Fusion team as well. <clears throat> Not like picking up players that don't make sense for the parent organization, if you like, but somebody like Alarm is going to be, no offense to Boombox, is going to be an enormous upgrade over poor young Isaac Charles. Is that his name, Isaac Charles? I think so, it's a baller name. Uh, when he gets to the point where he's 18. Like, Alarm's an absolute nut. And I think adding, like, Nice onto the team and creating an atmosphere where you're being competitive and perhaps can even function as a sister team to the actual Philadelphia Fusion squad so that you can drop that B part of your roster and have a sister team at the same time as having an academy team and it all feeds off each other. I think they're doing it, like, way better than everybody else. Maybe a difference in funding to be able to acquire these players in the first place, but they are, like, knocking the ball out of the park compared to some of these other dribbles. Yeah, I mean, there, one has to say, also now with the new um, region lock thing, soft region lock, it feels like now there's potential for these mixed rosters because, like, for instance, let's take someone like NYXL. They only have, like, three slots, realistically, where they can develop first-team talent because they're full Korean in the first team. So because, because of that, it, um, if, if you are a mixed roster like Fusion, and then if you do it even better and, like, move them maybe close to the location of the Overwatch League team, so these teams can scrim against each other and then have an, a contenders team also powered by these underage players it's like now you have in-house scrims that are on the yes on the probably on the lower or mid spectrum of overwatch league but you have pretty quality scrims in-house no leaks right so and then also developing the talent for that like it, it's it is certainly a big boon and i think more overwatch league teams are going to facilitate it that type of development more next season because really I was quite surprised how few players were moved up or even got uh, two-way contracts. I think the only really relevant ones are like Elk and then the two NYXL players, right? Yeah, yeah. but Snellu is the two-way, right? Still, yeah, so. exactly. Oh yeah, Elk as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I mean is, um, you know, promoting them to the first sure. team. Sure, I, I see what you mean. Having, having them capped around, you know, in the, your continuous team. And I guess Mame did it as well, but yeah, not too many interactions there. And even more interesting to see that a, a couple of organizations now defaulted on their chance to get an academy team, as we found out today. Seems like it, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually missed that one this morning. I had a busy morning. I don't know. Where gonna, I don't know. Where we're gonna discuss that, but we need to discuss that at some point. <clears throat> but there's. I mean, not... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 Joe, please. Well, I mean, I was I was just gonna transition into it. You know, um, I think the head coach of Second Wind announced publicly that they, uh, their team, Second Wind and First Generation, were officially invited back. So, from what you know, Yiska's kind of like 
theorizing is that there were teams that didn't want to come back in now exactly where they'll be placed within the divisional separation in north america we don't know yet that's still kind of up in the air so um it is to you know nice to know that some uh some third party orgs are getting in and you know hope hope the best for them. can we talk about a non third party org though can we talk about xl2 for a second sure we need to talk about this because this kind of uh blew up on social media this past week. And essentially what had happened was this. We saw a couple of players, <clears throat> uh, Mangachu, probably the most visible, but also um, Goliath and uh, Clone Man. Clone Man, yep. Had all announced that they're searching for new teams after this contender season with, uh, and, and I believe it was Mangachu and yeah. Goliath had both called out specifically that New York, uh, XL2 was looking for New York players. And that's at least implied why that they were uh, being being cut or let go or however you want to look at it. The community, at least publicly from what I've been trying to watch, has been pretty one-sided about this, that they're, that they're very against uh, this, this type of strategy. But uh, in Sideshow, I want to go to you first, man. So you, you've got this uh, contenders team and you've got obviously Overwatch League, which is designed around geographic locations being in cities. And you've got this contenders team trying to build a core around that city using their uh, contenders academy team. How do you feel about this move? If it is true, if we can take it at face value that the organization is in fact letting go of quote unquote good and serviceable players in favor of players that are more localized. Uh, how does that make you feel? I think there's many different aspects to this. Um, the organization has to consider, they can still get relegated between like season one and season two of 2019, right? Yep. I, I think that's still the case, even though yeah. they get automatically invited back at the beginning of every new year. So the, they should not be making a team that is going to get relegated after season one. That would be a disaster for them. So I've got to assume that they're going to make some kind of roster that's still going to be at least competent and try and integrate some New York people. So if they do it so that it's full on, they are picking up like a bunch of players just from New York or just from New York and the surrounding area, and they end up creating a roster that isn't good enough to compete in contenders, they are going to suffer for it. And they're going to see the results of that very quickly. And it's going to be a, a very bad move for them. Now, if they manage to create a roster that's competent, as in it's able to avoid relegation over the next couple of seasons, but they still manage to pull in a couple of New York players, stuff like that, the question becomes much more nebulous, I think. It's whether the public, and the public here doesn't really mean the competitive Overwatch, the public means the potential audience potential fan audience of XL2 or NYXL as well, the, the people in New York that they really want to get to, are they going to view a team that isn't as good but still kind of contends, which is has as many New York players as you can feasibly put on it to maintain that level of competition? Are they going to be able to kind of see through the cynicism of that and say, why don't you just get a better team? Or are they going to really appreciate the fact that there's a couple of New York people to go on there? I think history within Overwatch would suggest that the fans enjoy connecting with people that are from where they are from despite the fact that the team is going to be worse and i don't think there's any argument that the team is going to be worse it's from the point of view of anybody that likes competition and likes the fact that xl2 were good and likes the players that were on there i think this is going to be a bad move for xl2's competition level but that's not what they're trying to do with their academy team they're trying to go for marketing and they're trying to go with this fine balance of we have to be good enough so that we don't get relegated and good enough so that people will still support us but also have enough local talent to the point where people really engage with that aspect. And if you think about traditional sports, like the English Premier League, for example, the amount of people you have on a roster normally is way bigger than like the 11 people that make the field. And the amount of people that would be from the surrounding area of that football team that would be actually playing in the starting 11 is really quite small. And we're trying to take that model and kind of apply it to a team of only six so like how many is reasonable for somebody to come from if you're looking at xl2 how many new york people should you really expect to be starting on this roster if you think about traditional sports and apply the model it's probably only like one maybe two so 
I don't really know why they've let go of this team or why they feel like they have to go so hardcore into localization. If it pays off for them and it ends up being good marketing, fair play to the organization, I think we lose something in terms of the competition and contenders. And they will potentially lose a lot by taking this more risky approach to it because they could just get relegated. To be fair, though, so so here's here's some of the justifications I've kind of heard from you know, some of my friends in, in organization and elsewhere where they're like, this might work in the sense in, in you use the word it might pay off the, the term it might pay off. And, and I think that that's something that teams have struggled a little bit in their academy and tier two scenes is payoff. How do we find a way to make these these rosters actually pay off, not just uh, for themselves and pay for themselves, but also pay for their parent organization who are kind of footing the bill for those players' salaries and whatever else? If, if there is hypothetically a world where there are enough New York players to actually compete at a high enough level. Let's not even let's let's even say, you know, not not even just high enough to not get relegated, but to actually compete for maybe like a playoff spot. Like this this has that has to be a good move, right? Like what if they just believe that there's enough good local talent that they can do what they did last season but with local players. All right, so even if that was the case, let's play devil's advocate to your argument here. If that was the case, and you could still build a really good team. Sure, okay, I'll, I'll play the devil's advocate. All right, I'll play. I'll play the good lord's advocate, okay. the, yeah. the good lord of Overwatch competitions advocate. If that was the case, and you could make a New York team that was competent and was as good as XL2 was previously, do you really benefit anything? What is the viewership like for North American contenders compared to the Overwatch League? When are your casual New York fans that you're trying to appeal to going to be interacting with these players and identify them with the NYXL brand? Are they, if they do get attached to these players, where are they going? They can't go to NYXL because it's a full Korean team. This would work, I think, as a marketing pitch if you had a mixed roster. Someone like Guangzhou Charge, who've already proven that they can take players from China, Korea, uh, England, all over the fucking place. They can actually take a, a model like this, have an academy team, and know that the players, if you could really get attached to them and get like uh, some Chinese players that get a bit of a fever around them, can get plugged into Guangzhou and go somewhere in the future. With XL2, I feel like they're barking up the wrong tree because the, even if you, the New York fans get attached to these players and it creates a buzz around them, what do you do? You just sell them? And then the New York players on a different team. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that, that is actually a really good point uh, because assuming that the goal is ultimately to get people to love these players that are from New York and then to see them play on the big stage, isn't that kind of a symptom, though, of maybe the Tier 2 team stage being too small? I think so. I think that, you know, if if Contenders is a lot more healthy, which, you know, we are progressing in the right direction, I think, um, in terms of viewership, you know, it's it's slowly growing. But this doesn't tend to make sense. And that's where I kind of am, am leaning towards this. I think Giscard brought up a good point when this whole news had broke uh, that he, he thought that NYXL thought people were going to like this move, that this was a good PR move behind the scenes. Like they theory crafted that this was actually going to be something positive that they were leaning for, um, which I kind of, uh, you know, tossed around a bit and, and kind of enjoyed. Um, but we've kind of already seen this example done before. Philly did this when they signed Rowan PLB on Twitter. Um, and then they he, he played, I think, a total of three games and then was dropped. You know, when when you're faced with the large gun of relegation, there's not a lot of, you know, leeway on who you can sign. And if they're, you know, up to snuff when it comes to contenders, contenders is not easy. When you have some of the best Korean talent coming over that aren't able to play in the Overwatch League, do you have space to sign NY players? I would say no. Yeah. All right, boys, get your <laughs> okay. hazmat suits on. I hope they protect against bad PR because I'm going locally on this. There is a theory where I have seen the official paperwork and from the official pa paperwork, it doesn't say that these grandfathered players don't count as local residents right now. So there is a cynical worldview where NYXL picks up three Korean players. If that happens, 
I want to see a shitstorm for that justification they gave, especially Mr. Bitter in private channels. I'm fucking done with that P PR bullshit right there. That, that right. would be, be an absolute... Even if they just t pick up one Korean player, it would be hilarious. The players they kicked arguably aren't even worse than the Koreans they are currently on the team. Hu Yal is a sh show. TZ is sort of serviceable. It's, it's honestly a joke that, uh, in which way they approach this. So, okay, let's think of if they work it out as it does, right? I'm not sure if the situation is co just completely wildly different in, in Europe with how academy teams work here. So, for instance, I, I'm pretty sure it's pretty much the same for English f football clubs. We don't... Uh, we don't have that so entwined with colleges or whatever, right? Mm. With schools. Here it's more like, okay, a professional f football team has an academy, right? Why is there a responsibility to connect to colleges? Why is there a responsibility to con connect to local schools? Why can you not do that alone? What, what the problem actually was, I think, is NYXL saw, okay, we want, kind of want to keep uh, Flower around and want to have some people to play with him. And then we also want Nene. Okay, so what about the others? Yeah, we yeah, okay, kind of need a team. Yeah, okay, let's let's see if we can sell them. What? No one is willing to pay us big money for these players at the end. Oh, this is see this red number here. That's a minus. We we don't care about this. Completely disregarding the actual moral or value code that is in esports where, yes, we are going on lo localization in Overwatch, but then again, like, I, I can also see where there could be an element of this, and if they, like, slowly introduce these types of players into these sources and had them hang around as an eighth player, as a seventh player even, that would have been completely fine with me to dryly just drop them, even, and that is the worst part, I don't think, or to my, the best of my knowledge, it wasn't communicated to other teams at the time, and this has been in the works for a while, that they were not going to have a buyout. So these players didn't even ha have a chance to go, you know, like, search for teams before that content was dropped, even though they knew that was going to happen for a while. That also sits uh, unwell with me. And tend to, to defend that on some moral high horse, no. Like, th that is completely unacceptable for me. And also, I think, very morally questionable what they pulled there. You got your episode of Thinking It Over on the show. <laughs> it was the best. This is why you need to subscribe to Yiska on YouTube, because this is the type of content that you miss <laughs> all the time. Just go subscribe to Yiska out on YouTube right now. Go do it. Just just you know, shut the f thing that you're doing right now and go do it. I don't I, I mean I obviously don't have the brain capacity to add anything to that. So I'm I'm, I'm relying on Sideshow and Joe here. I mean, I can't, I can't really disagree with anything that he said. Um, you know, you've cut some very, very good Western players for either a bold-faced lie or a guise and an attempt to facilitate some local growth, which is kind of a, a, a road to hell paved with golden bricks kind of argument where you're going to drop them all before season one ends because if you don't you, you face relegation right and that's not something that i think they want to uh to look forward to or they don't want to uh to deal with this is only a two season year from now on um there's not like multiple different chances to come back in through trials there you know, oh, yeah. this is, that's actually this... a really good point as well because that minimizes the chance of relegation essentially yes. isn't it as long as you can squeak through season one they don't care about getting relegated in season two because they get invited back in 2020 presumably as, as yeah as well, if if we if we continue with the the rule set kind of logic if they add more teams they'll you know yeah. uh, allow academy teams to just jump yeah. back uh, ahead of the pack which again that's another question or that's another kind of rule that we could debate about um for the record i'm not necessarily for it but yeah, it's 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 just a mess. Uh, not not a, not a fan. Not a fan. I want to talk about this more, but we can't because we brought Sideshow on for a reason, and that's to discuss <laughs> his power rankings and compare it to ours and roast him. And I feel like Giska's in a really good 
mental position right now <laughs> to start the roasting because he's a little fiery. We got the warm up going, and I'm really excited about this one. So, uh, for those of you who are listening via audio, um, I have a link down below. I probably forgot about it, so it's on our Twitter at OWL Daily Show. But uh, if I didn't forget about it, it's down in the uh, show description below. If it's not, I'm sorry, I forgot. But if you're watching on video, you can see it over to the right of me, I guess. Techni- yeah, it's still the right of me. You can see Yiska, myself, and Joe's top 20 power rankings for Overwatch League Season 2. And... We've done a lot of qualifying for these w- rankings. We've done over five hours, actually, of uh, discussing these picks from number 20 all the way to number one, why they're there, why they aren't higher or lower. Looking at you, Uprising and uh, Outlaws fans, my God, listen to the episode before you tweet me, please. Just listen to Too the episode. Work. Just listen. All you have to do is listen to the episode. The problem is me telling you this right now. It's not going to matter because you're not going to tweet me about it because you're not listening to the episode. But besides that, uh, talking number 20 through number one, the Sideshow today has been so gracious as to wait. He waited to post his power rankings until just hours before the show so he can come on and defend his power rankings, and we can come on and roast him a little bit about this power rankings. All right, that wasn't just because I got the patience of a god. I mean, I do. But also, I needed to find... I was kindly gifted by Volamel, the vods of Arming, who is this uh, enigma of a main tank for the Chengdu Hunters, because down at the bottom of my power rankings, I simply could not decide where certain teams went. And honestly, I had Chengdu very close to the bottom of my power rankings for a long time. And after reviewing some VODs last night, I decided that there is actual salvageable potential with that team. And I was so close to writing them off completely. I was like, I thought this was the new Shanghai Dragons for quite a while. Just from what I'd heard from like how the tank line in particular was performing. And then when I looked at them last night and really like watched quite a lot of their VODs, we watched about three, four hours of uh, of this main tank and the off tank that was there. I came to the decision that they do not have, in my opinion, the worst tank line in the league. So that was one of the reasons why I uh, waited until now to publish a power ranking. Joe, I wanted are you, to watch are actually you some holding, content. Joe, you didn't show me these videos. You didn't even say, be like, hey, you might want to check these out, you idiot. Whoa! They are publicly available online. Like, anybody you just gotta can find them. them. Yeah, I don't, just I don't quick... want to do that. I rely on a few specific <laughs> websites like uh, Winston's <laughs> like Lab. Like Liquipedia. May she rest in peace. And uh, Yiska <laughs> and Joe and Liquipedia to... They're on to... Liquipedia. They're on... But, uh... Are they? You, you just gotta know. You just gotta know where to look. I don't know how to find vods on for, a, for an easy payment. Of Are you kidding? Five ninety nine a month. You too. I just can find a quick VODs call out. A quick call out to my uh, former housemate Jonathan Reinforced Larson as well. Who, when I looked through his power rankings, I was like, "This man has not seen any vods of some of these players." <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was looking through, and I'm like, "Toronto Defiant in 18," and he said, "Some benched owl pickups and contenders players was it, <laughs> was its justification." I was like, "One of those benched owl? Th- there's only one benched owl player for starters, yeah. unless you mean Neko. It wasn't benched because he was bad. He was like the third best Zen in the entire league." And then he's talking about some contenders players, as if a lot of the t- you make an expansion teams, mate. Of course, you have to pick up contenders players. That doesn't mean they're going to be 18th. Oh. Ah, breaking oh, his man. head somebody i didn't know we were LA, roasting otherwise reinforce i thought we were roasting sideshow on this show but apparently well, we i've got to do some roasting beforehand so that <laughs> okay I'm fair enough yeah. pre-roasting mm. fair enough the pre-roast roast what is that called <laughs> brazing no yeah, idea there you go. is that what it is we're brazing before the roast <laughs> yeah, just brazing him <laughs> good enough all right sideshow we're gonna do the same thing for you we're gonna start at number 20 we're gonna go down okay can yeah, I okay. real quick just establish some things so yes. I can understand it better? Yeah. Okay. What does power rankings mean to you? What is what is the thing yeah. that like is it like for instance I said okay this is what I expect at the end of the um the season that is what I can expect the those placings to be without knowing the meta without anything yes also incorporating I, I a, divisional play just, and yeah I have a similar definition to you I think. 
power rankings traditionally just to set a little bit of context are normally like what you see on paper right now if everyone took a tournament and just played but i don't think that has any value coming into the league because a lot yeah. of these teams are like building for the season and are looking for obviously like the placement at the end of the season so if that's their goal that should be our goal in trying to assess that so some of these teams i think are going to be poorer at the beginning of the season but i expect them to improve over time or some of them like i'm taking the strength of schedule into account as well so like if they have a really tough beginning but it doesn't matter that much etc or like if they have a tendency to underperform in playoffs i'm also knocking them down a little bit so i'm not so much thinking like these are my top 12 teams and they're going to make the playoffs and then where are they going to rank in the playoffs but i'm taking a number of these placings into account so i am also adding in like some playoff performance concepts as well um where i think a couple of teams like for example soul i think have the tendency i think in big matches to uh, to collapse a little bit so that's why i've rated them lower than perhaps i would if it was just where they would be at the end of the regular season nyxl as well i would expect them to rate very well in the regular season i expect them to do not do as well in um uh, in playoffs compared to the regular season as mm. they did this season so mm. yeah those are the kind of things that i'm taking into account it's more of a, a kind of without knowing anything about the meta or even early uh season suspensions where i would expect them to place at the end given what i know all right we have the same rulers sir uh, now we fight yeah it's good we understand now we're there good. <laughs> all right sideshow give us the rundown number 20 Number 20, as I said on the Overwatch League desk, actually, is the Washington Justice for me. I think this is the weakest team on paper, probably, and I think it's got a bunch of different problems. I think they've got the weakest support line in the league with Fazik, Skido, and Kionu. I think uh, the two players with experience they've got are classically role players surrounded by other really great players. Like, yes, they did play on championship-level teams, but Guido... Honestly, Guido winning the finals MVP really is a poor piece of evidence in his favor. Because if you go back and watch like his performance overall, he was really a role player on the team. He's not like some star tracer. He, he was playing tracer and he's not like a really top level tracer and wasn't even at the time. It's just people credited the fact that he was able to come in over who are you. They added a lot of these contextual things when they said he was a finals MVP. And so... He's not even playing Tracer anymore as well. He's playing Flex Support, which he did for a little uh, amount of time. And then Janus, surrounded by NYXL players, was quite clearly a problem. Most of the times they subbed him in. They should have just stuck to Mano the entire time, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not sure I rate him as low as some of the other analysts, actually, but I don't think he's going to be particularly good on this team where he's surrounded by worse players. And even the players that have potential on this team, like Ado and maybe even Corey, I don't think they're surrounded by good enough players to be able to excel. I think... San Sam on off tank, come on. I think probably the worst at his position in the league as well. This is just a team that I am really not high on in the slightest. Communication issues on top of that as well because they speak Korean and English. I mean, the, of all the other teams that could be down here, basically, in my opinion, there's two. It would be Chengdu and Florida, and it's between the three of them, like which one you put at the bottom. I think it's Washington Justice all the way. Joe. You were the one who placed the justice the highest at number 17. Um, I did. Among I did. the four of us. And I saw you nodding. I saw you smirking. I want to give you an opportunity here. Because obviously you have the the uh, biggest, the biggest idea discrepancy. Difference, discrepancy. Uh, naturally, Sideshow and I uh, agree. Oh, naturally. Uh, naturally. Big brain. I agree. That's why I've always so, said about you, Kick Tribe. What big brain. <laughs> that's right. You got it. <laughs> Right there. How does it feel to <laughs> agree? You're like, oh crap! I agree with Kick Tripod. Do I need to re <laughs> reconsider this placement? <laughs> I get it. Uh, Joe, I want to give you a chance though to say because so you put come... him up at 17. Uh, tell me, you said yes. something about San Sam, which I believe, if I remember correctly, you did not have that opinion of San Sam. I don't. I could be, my memory is not what it used to be. It's not what I used to remember either. <laughs> uh, I, I, to be completely up, honest, Sasha. I've never been, never been that uh, knowledgeable, honestly, of San Sam. Like his name never really stuck out to me. Is either a good or bad thing. But after doing some bot review, yeah, not my favorite flex tank in the world. Um, this is more predicated on the fact that from season one, I quite 
I quite enjoyed how much one single person can do. And I do think that Otto can be that that person. But Sideshow does bring up a good point that the pieces around him aren't uh, aren't the best, to say the least. Um, you're, you're taking a star level Tracer player and putting him on flex deep, or flex support. We, we've seen one game out of him. It's, it's tough to even use the MVP vote as an argument. Um, uh, it, it'll be rough. Um, at the time, I, I started to... It, it was for, for me, most of it was Otto and Wizard Young. If Wizard Young is, is kind of uh, who he says he is and can, you know, money ball yes, this. That's, that's the other aspect to this as well. I think there's so much of these teams that you could say, I have faith in X and X coach. Yeah. And so I, I personally in these rankings have put less weight in, I think, in the Krusty than uh, you three have, I yeah, think. Yeah. Where I haven't uh, rated uh, San Francisco Shock as highly as I believe all three of you have. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe only two. We're of the you. same, um, dude. It's number the same I, number. Okay, you and me. And I haven't rated Boston as low as any of you have. I really think that people are underrating Boston coming into this season. Um, Good when for they you. put them at, there, you like, go. In Boston Uprising Discord. That one's for you. Yeah, that one's for you. But I think that a lot of this is just unknowable. Like the amount of weight you put in mm. a guy like Wizard Hyung or Krusty or Huck or Pavane or anything. We. There's no way of knowing what's going on behind the scenes because they're all so closed about it. There's a few coaches that we know are good and we know their methods and we know that they are able to improve things. And we know that Krusty is capable from all the reports that we've heard. But we don't know whether Huck is capable at all, basically. And we don't know whether Wizard Young is really capable. He was the only guy that spoke really fluent English on that NYXL team. And so he was in a perfect position to PR himself. Managed to somehow professing his incredible genius to the entire world with evidence and logic and all of these other things that made him essentially like a meme that just kept on giving but he could still be really talented yeah even if you're the most talented coach in the entirety of the overwatch league there is a huge difference between working for nyxl where you're yes. working with some of the best players in the entire world and the washington justice where you're working with some of the worst players on paper in the entire league in my opinion this guy is going to have his work cut out for him. He's got to make gold out of a turd. And then yeah. that's that's kind of exactly why I put them a little bit ahead of Boston. Um, and you bring up a good point. Um, when you compare the coaches, you know, we've seen Wizard Young come out and produce some content to explain, you know, his thought process on the game. And, you know, he, he won me over a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Um, whereas he as Huck is we yeah, exactly. So I, I, I do value that a little bit higher. I do look at Otto. I've seen what he can do. I, I, I kind of, I wouldn't say I discovered him. I think that's a little bit too strong, but I saw like a, a small data set when he first started to pop off on the scene and they were unreal numbers. We saw what he could do, especially on that Shanghai team that was kind of just thrown together mid season. He was a standout when you put him in a, in an actual foundation, when you put him in a structured environment, can he succeed? I do think he can. Do I think the pieces around him are, are good? No, not really. That's why I have him at 17th. Why do I have them above Boston? When I look at the, the pieces around Boston, same thing, right? Not very good. Kind of just lackluster. I do think, you know, Gamsu, yes, they've kept him around. That's not bad. I don't hate that. I kind of value him at the same level as, as John is, to be honest with you. You know, it, where is this world where, where you know, He's he's this insane Korean you know main tank that's coming. Gamsu was good, man. He, Gamsu was fine. good last season. He's okay, fine. Gamsu, Gamsu was fine in the context of being like a, a decent Korean main tank. Sure. Janice frequently had situations where he would get caught out with the most disciplined roster behind him in the whole of the rest of the Overwatch League. Would go for flanks that ended up not working sure. for him. Sure and was statistically inferior to his co-tank the entire time. And I think Boston just, I mean, we're skipping ahead here, but really this is like a pivotal point of my rankings that seems to disagree Fair with enough. everyone else's. I mean, well, forgotten Boston finished fifth last season and ended up actually being a really good team. Their core is good. They got Aim God who was putting up better numbers than Neko, and Neko was easily the third best Zen in the league. And despite mm. the fact that Aim God lost all of the games that he was playing because they were just getting trashed as a team. But Aim God's just sat at the back firing out orbs, actually being a really competent Zen Yata. He's going to be very good next season. The the only thing they need to fix is their DPS line, and they only have one DPS player eligible for the first three games, so they have to sign one. So as long as they sign a good DPS player, they're Gucci, man. Boston Uprising <laughs> are going to be perfectly fine in the middle of the table next season. I'm telling you. Perfectly fine to miss playoffs. You're, you're, all, you're all playing in the Hux master plan, where he's like... And that's, know, like, that's, oh, that's fine. 
<laughs> when 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 I when I get another sample that he can throw this this absolutely dark horse roster together, I will I will bend the knee. I'll eat the egg. But, you know, there's big crow is to have. What is, what is dark horse about this roster? They have the same tank line, uh, the same support line that they had in stage four, and it's just two different DPS. Like, yes, you've lost Striker. He was sure. fantastic. No denial there. Absolutely incredible talent. But as long as one of Blase or Color Hex performs to a reasonable level, and we've seen that his scouting tends to be actually fairly decent, That's Blase true. is fairly mechanically talented. Color Hex, I don't know as much about him. I haven't watched many of his Australian VODs. He didn't look like he was that great when we saw him in the World Cup, but his team got smashed, so who knows? But as long as they sign somebody decent alongside, I don't think Boston is going to be this terrible team that everyone thinks they're going to be. I think they just saw that Striker was gone and Krusty was gone and why panicked. You, why are you and as long about, as Krusty wasn't building everything, why fine. are you talking about Boston in stage four like they were good though? They're four and six. But the overall mechanical level was still very good. They uh, underperformed because the dive meta disappeared and they lost their head. As long as they still have time to prepare, they'll be fine. Maybe, and again, right? And obviously, I'm which the worst... head coach did they get, Sideshow? Okay, so yeah, Krusty yeah. was never a head coach. Krusty was never a head that's, coach. That's he was a coach true. that had limited, uh, even limited power over the team in the first place. So not having a new head coach doesn't matter as much. And they picked up Gunba, and this is another crucial point for Boston. Is I think people are first of all forgetting that Gunba was even added, and just thinking Krusty left. Yes. It's yes. Hook in charge of everything. He's the madman running the ship. Like <laughs> the people were saying that like, before Krusty even left, dude. But like, I think Gunbar is very good. I I really rate Gunbar. I think he's a very intelligent person. All of I the content he's put out is 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 uh, stellar. I think the way that the LA Valiant played last season was intelligent. I think he'll be able to do good work with this team. Will he be another Krusty? Perhaps not. I think he'll still be fine. I don't know, yeah, man. But... Like, uh, man, saying like, oh, they have the same stage, they have the same core as stage four, and they were good. They were four and six. And, and I, but and they I have wanna... exactly the same core as stage three as well, where they went absolutely undefeated, except aim god instead of Neko. And if we're talking like, what the difference between stage three and four was the fact that they didn't have Neko and had aim god? No, he was. The two were. I mean, it's the meta incomparable thing mainly, yeah, and then also the social fabric of that team collapsing but exactly yes but i think we're kind of ignoring the fact that teams have added some amazing talent i think the level has increased from last season so is it enough to be four and six in stage four you know with very noticeable meta change deficiencies when you're you're losing coaches no. there's reports coming out that i don't think it is I, I don't think it's and that's I why i have them enough. lower but if, I if it's not, not we're not around. talking about the boston uprising we're not 19. talking about them right now <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about them right now. All right. Reel it in. Sure. Reel it in. Number 20. Wait, Number can, can 20 I just drop <laughs> okay. va yeah. valiant, valiant effort by Washington Justice to sort of defend their roster in the Washington Post? Going like, yeah, the star player of NYXL, Janus. Janus was legitimately the only player on NYXL that wasn't a star. Like, yeah. get out! Rough. Your enemies of language. It's it's Rough. over. Like everyone is a star now. I I will I will forfeit that point and say it did feel like he was completely shoehorned within that roster. Am I a little bit more hopeful? You know the LW Blue kind of separation. You know he's he's kind of out of that system, working with who I think could be a good coach maybe it was a style thing you know i can i can excuse it all i like it was a poor performance without a doubt right um I, i'm just a little bit more bullish on them i guess uh, i'll be happy again i'm happy to be wrong on any of these um joe and i it, are optimists i can be yeah sometimes you're, i'm a bit cynical optimist, oh, oh don't worry if you take a look at my graph here where do i have outlaws is that optimistic i don't just we gotta saying. we gotta keep going. We're we're so far. We're so yeah, far yeah, yeah. behind schedule right now. We <laughs> need to go to number nineteen, Sideshow. Who do you have nineteen and why are they from the Florida panhandle? Yes. I haven't actually looked 19, at your, I your rankings, by the way. <laughs> I, have I have the Florida Mayhem in number nineteen. I think this was very close for me for like 18, 19, and 20 with Chengdu, Florida, and Washington Justice, but I think I've got some good reasons why I've put them in this order. So I have Justice at the bottom, but Florida, I think, should be next. I think this is washed up central. This is like a laundromat that this this team has gone through. 
They have got some real old talent that's like two years out of date. They're stale, a lot of these players. And they've got, uh, I think, probably the worst tank line in the Overwatch League. I, I'm not 100% sure because, as I said, the Chengdu tank line is weird as hell. But um, I think I'd be confident, fairly confident, in saying that Florida has the worst tank line in the league. They have got uh, players that underperformed last season, so we have like positive evidence of them not being as good. SNT, previously known as Awesome Guy, had really poor performances, was one of the worst main tanks that we had last season. And then uh, Swan, it, previously known as Butcher as well, is like uh, not that great of a main tank either. Then they've got Hagapion and Chris. Now, I'm higher on Hagapion than a lot of people are, and I still don't think he's that great. I think he's a pretty good caller. I think that he's a decent mechanical zen. I don't think by any means that this is going to be the worst backline in the league, but I think it's going to be fairly close. Chris has not played in a long time. And then they've got communication issues with their DPS, and they're only two Korean DPS, both play hitscan. I mean, this is a really, really weird roster that I don't think is going to work well together. And the only reason that I have them higher is because I expect Washington Justice to be worse. It's honestly what I think. It's like, it's Florida Mayhem look really bad, but I think Washington Justice are going to be worse, and maybe Florida can find some decent play out of, like, putting Swan in there, like maybe Hagapion and Chris both reached their previous heights because they have been decent players in the past before. Certainly better than Guido and Janice have been. If I'm comparing like previous championship caliber, you can't really call Chris that, but he was okay when he was on like a reasonably good team in Meta Athena. So that's why I got them in 19 rather than 20. And you've got, just just so we, we might have to compartmentalize these a little bit. You have Chengdu Hunters at 18. Yes. All right, so Chengdu, Chengdu and, Hunters and, and tell are us about that really quick. See? And then we could talk about Mayhem, because I don't think that we're going to disagree a whole lot on Mayhem, yeah. because we had 19, yeah. 19, 20. But Chengdu yeah. Hunters at 18. Joe, the Optimist, had him at 16. Tell us a little bit about Chengdu Hunters at number 18. Sorry for you audio listeners. This is, that's confusing. This is important. There's a lot bet on this. So why is Florida better than, or worse than Chengdu? So the reason that I have... Chengdu higher than Florida is that I can see um, Chengdu perhaps linking some wins together based off the fact that they have some incredibly aggressive DPS players that play a very unorthodox style, and the team in general is set up to play a very unorthodox style, and I can see them stealing wins off these lower level teams. Um, now, unfortunately, they're also in the Pacific Division, which is a much harder division for them because every other team is competent in the Pacific Division. There are a lot of worse teams in the Atlantic Division. It's much lower stacked. So maybe this won't play out because of their worst strength of schedule, but I think the Chengdu Hunters have a very weird team, and weird for China sometimes results in wins, but it could result in them just being 20th dead last. I completely take that as a, a possibility. But I think their tank line is going to be okay. Uh, Ameng is very odd. He doesn't play Winston very often, but his Winston decision-making looked okay when we were looking over the few VODs that remain available. Uh, Elsa, I would expect to start at the off-tank position as well, who looked okay again. Yep. Not feeding, but not really like a, even a mid-level off-tank in terms of the Overwatch League. And they have DPS players that are just going to like bot into you. And as long as Ryu, their coach, can actually create yeah, some system that the term works for them. Show, by the way, it's oh, my yeah. favorite they're term gonna, on the show. Yeah, they are really suicidal. Like I was watching yeah. the DPS players, and they are just going to run into you. And they've got like uh, YXL who hasn't played in ages, Bacon Jack who hasn't played in ages as well. There's so many unknowns about this team that I think that reasonably you could expect them to go from twentieth to maybe at their peak. I would say fifteenth. I'm not expecting big things from them. But I am expecting a big swing in what's capable. They could easily not win any games this season, I think, if their tank line is really poor and their coach doesn't put good systems in place to increase their discipline whilst also making them play weird styles. But if they perform at an average level from what I'd expect from these players and from this coach, I think they should be able to edge out the Washington Justice and Florida Mayhem. Yes, guy, I need to ask you this because this is going to be in direct conflict. With you, everybody else agrees. Hunters over mayhem, except for you. You have one more. You have one one last opportunity to ask any questions, any clarifying things. Make that final point here, because I mean, 
I don't know if I want to do a podcast with you and Joe where you, you have to call him Lord the whole time. <laughs> so, A, the divisions just are completely stacked against Chengdu. B, Chengdu has probably zero star players for me, while even Florida at least has Sire player. Um, and with Washington Justice, or, okay, the, the other contention is, of course, Houston Outlaws. I think there's no question that they, you have to set them higher than Chengdu. Um, yeah, overall, I think just that the divisions completely should take care of Chengdu as a team over Florida. I think the division is a very good uh, argument against them. I think that's completely fair. I think when you actually look at where their um, players rank, I think the support line of the Chengdu Hunters is better than both the Florida Mayhem and the Washington Justice, despite being some fellow, like relatively unknown Chinese players. And I think that their tank line could be, it is better than the Florida Mayhem tank line as well, despite again being unknown Chinese players. And it just comes down to whether they can find some star potential out of their DPS. Like YXL has been a very good DPS in the past. Bacon Jack has been a good DPS in the past, and Jinmu thinks he's an incredible DPS, <laughs> which he, he might he plays he like might a god be able to accomplish. So yeah. I, I see the pound for pound talent of this roster as being probably better than Florida Mayhem apart from Sire Player, and probably better than the Washington Justice, apart from Addo and maybe Corey, but they, they're going to get messed up by all of these problems with their, co uh, with their um, communication, I think. All right. I, love I it. don't think this is a great Chinese team, though. I think China, again, is going to come out of 2019 looking like a joke, yep. which is unfortunate. Yeah. Like, hopefully, Gushui and Crystal and Eileen and these kind of people actually step up and are allowed to play in 2019. Otherwise, people are going to think that China are terrible again, even though, as we saw in the World Cup, and as we've known for quite a while, they could make one, maybe two decent teams. Yeah, two, two, two is a stretch. I think two. You're still getting like Chengdu level roster, but yes, right. there is a Chinese super team out there that is there. There, there can be made. There's, there's bits and pieces scattered along of these these expansion teams that if you just compile them coming into season three with some of the. Uh, more of age players, people like Leaf, people like Shy. You've got a, a, a contender for at least playoff. <laughs> there, there's some um, Chinese team quite, playoffs. Quite good What's talent. That like? Yeah, yeah. That's, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Overwatch season, season two. Three, I think. We don't think so. Uh, Sideshow number seventeen for us. Let's jump into the next one. Paris Eternal for me. I think their coaching staff is excellent. I got a lot of respect for all of the guys that are on there. Um, but I think they're working with some of the most inexperienced and some of the... See, the problem is weakest doesn't really encapsulate it because the, the players that are on that roster are not weak, but they are a year away from being where they would want to be. Or for a couple of their players, I don't think are ever going to be where they'd like them to be. Uh, they've got a, a lot of potential to use that buzzword. But I'm not sure even the coaching staff that they have is going to actually be able to turn them into a great team. Their DPS line is okay. Um, their tank line is fairly untested, uh, at, with a big question mark around their off tank, in my opinion. Um, and then their, uh, their back line is um, all right as well. There's a lot of room for growth for this team, but I just don't see them growing in time to be able to actually bring results home. So I love that you said that, but we but we have a we have a thing here that we talk about, and that is uh, it, 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 we don't call it a cop out. It's not a cop out at all. But there's something that always happens with players' favorite Overwatch League team, and it's basically it's this team has a lot of potential. I think they can do a really good job, and uh, I think that they could really you know you know uh, they have a lot of potential. You know they can do a really good job. And they got a lot of upsides. Yeah, yeah they got a lot the of upside. Yeah, upside. Thank you. That's that's the thing. And and, and uh, to to me here, it sounds like. And again, Eternal, we've had people tweet us. We've had people say in Twitch chat, in YouTube comments, that this is a EU super team sideshow. Nah, come off it. Who's 
Who's the super team on this team? This th this is nonsense. You could make an EU super team, but the players are already in the Overwatch League. And if you're making a super team out of the tier two talent, then you would expect them to not be at the top of the Overwatch League as well. Like this this team, the off tank situation doesn't really make sense. Finzi is fairly unproven. He didn't play for the LA Valiant when he was signed. Don't know whether that was visa issues or whether that was just because they didn't want to play him. Uh, I mean, they played the rest of their B team, so it was weird that they didn't play him and put space in there instead. Nico can also play off tank. I think he's okay. I also think that he's one of their best DPS players. So what do they do in that situation? I think Shadowburn's past his prime. I think Danye still has a huge room to grow before he's really going to be a force on the owl stage. And I think soon is okay, but is more of like the role player that you want to put a real star player alongside or like the LA Valiant you want to have some awesome uh tanks or off tanks or system that has a very uh set positions for everybody to be in so that role players can really excel that their, their tank lines is like LH Cloud is good and apparently is a very good caller and I think it, they're going to be very decisive with him and Cruz doing most of the calling and they've got good coaches behind them but th they got they don't have enough individual skill, I think, to be able to carry them beyond this kind of bottom five tier that I've got them in. And I, so I got, Sideshow, I got trashed on for putting them at 16. I just want to say something right now. Sideshow has them at 17. So, there you go. I mean, the question is as well, who is going to be worse than them? That's yeah. what you've always got to think when it comes mm -hmm. to power rankings. It and who is, is yeah. going to be worse than this team? Yeah. If I don't think that Boston is going to be worse than them, which is unlike, I, I think, all of the rest of you, I, yeah. if I think Boston are going to be good, that's another team that can't be underneath them. And if I think that Outlaws have better team synergy and comparable individual skill, I'm not going to put Outlaws underneath them either. And a team like the Atlanta Reign, who I've got just above them, I think have better individual skill. Similar issues, but I think better individual skill so i can't justify putting anybody underneath the paris eternal even though if they really unlock all of this potential they could be a reasonably okay team i think even making the playoffs is a long shot for this team though if they manage to make it into the, like the 12th spot or sneak into playoffs i can't consider that a massive success oh, yeah. for paris eternal. yeah massive and this is what you said also is i think a lot of how we we ended up finding la gladiators at like top four five six seven is yeah. the same thing yeah. what are they doing there they're, they're they, on the, they shouldn't they're the, be there they but are they the are. flip side they are the agent smith to neo in overwatch league as far as like they're just like oh they're 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 the opposite they're the what's the math term we're antithesis. not going into this and and yeah antithesis, antithesis. okay that's not that's not the math term, but the that's foil. A term. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh yeah. Anyways. What term are you? I don't oh man, I I'll Google it. Somebody okay, sh okay. Uh, Twitch chat, Google it. What's the opposite of in like when you go from positive to negative, cancels each other out. Google it, let us know. We need the to antithesis. <laughs> it's not that that's not a math term. We need to go it's to not, it has something mathy. Okay. Reciprocal. No, inverse. inverse. Inverse is good. Inverse is good enough. Inverse. We're gonna say right. the inverse. They're the inverse of each other. All right, number si number sixteen, side show. I I mean I don't think that we're gonna spend. I mean here's the thing. I had so eternal fifteen for Yiska. Uh, fourteen for Joe. We weren't too far off here. No, we we're, weren't too far off at all. So let's just go on to number uh, si sixteen. Right, we're on to number sixteen. Let's, yeah, okay, number 16, yeah. as, I, as I alluded to, is the Atlanta Reign. And I think that this team wow. has a lot of good players. And I think the problem with them is, and I think this is really going to hurt them, which is why I've put them this low. I th this almost to me seems unfair to put them this low because their players are so good. I'm high on Daco and Pogbo. I'm high on Erster. I think Dafran, if he's playing well, is a beast. I think Massa is good as well, but I can't rate them any higher than this because I really don't think that the communication is gonna be ironed out in time. And I also don't think that their coaching staff is gonna be solid enough to be able to like make Dafran as good as he can be and integrate the tanks with the rest of their team and be able to make this like a fully functioning team. I see like another team that's been well scouted and might not be put together very well. And recently I was asking a couple of people um, about the coaching staff behind this team. Um, and 
perhaps I might be in the wrong here because I'm uh, because I have uh, a lack of in-depth knowledge of some of these tier two coaches that were coming in and so they may prove me wrong but what's the name of this guy i think he's called kasaurus or something Kasaurus, guy, yeah. yeah guy from the netherlands called kasaurus who i believe is doing uh quite a lot of the strategic coaching for them now if he can step up and be like a really competent coach then maybe they're going to fulfill their potential in which case they'd be a lot higher than this but i think the atlanta rain has a lot of intangible issues that they have to overcome to be able to reach their their goal i also doesn't speak english very well they popo isn't the greatest main tank in the world. He was just added to like a, a really great team. I think Darko is good, but he's now in the big leagues. Uh, Dufran, you wouldn't expect him to be the beast that he has been previously. I think Leia is like really aggressive and at times just feeds on DPS. Um, and I don't know how they're going to deal with Massa main, main uh, calling when he's got a very thick uh, Finnish accent. So I can see this team like dropping Dude. quite a lot of crucial games early on. You, yeah, I mean, the thing is, if anything, like the team, this team has enough skill in them that they just, if they have to, can play Morse code on people's heads, yeah. just like signaling to their to their teammates. Metaphorically, meaning, I think they just have way too much skill to be this slow. Like I, I even had, I even felt a little bit bad for putting them twelfth. To be honest, I think their back, their front line is nuts good. I think Arista is very, very good. I also th probably am higher on Kodak than you are. I think he, at yeah, I think you can expect him to be sort of like boombox level uh, of play. Um, really? I yeah. think that's uh, that. Yes, that's way higher than I would have him as well. I think this backline is okay, but I'm mostly expecting the kind of backline that's. Um, competent and is able to give calls and doesn't really have that much impact in the in the game. I'm also expecting Pogpo to not really be that impactful when it comes to the competition that he's playing against. I did a little thing a couple of days ago because I like to get like rankings in order because they're a good way of thinking about where you really think someone's like mm. how good you really think somebody is because you're forced to put people on top of the person that you think is good and you're like alright well, actually they're like 10th best or something and I think Pogpo and Dako were very good when it came to the tier two level, but they are against some real stellar competition when it comes to the Overwatch League. There are a lot of very good tank lines currently in in our. Yeah. Even the expansion teams that got brought in, guys like uh, uh, No Smite and Rhea, and then Rio and Hopper. Uh, I think these are going to be tank lines that will be on par with Popo and D and Daco. And so, where do, their star power is then lost. Like, you had star power when you were playing against tank lines that were really bad, but now you're just good, you're like a mid-table tank line. So you don't really have the star power to be able to carry your team further, higher than the rest would be able. Fair enough. Okay. We need to go on to number 15. Can you believe that we have 15 more slots to go? Here's the thing, though. You've made Boston Uprising fans happy. So far, yes. I'm hoping that you're gonna make uh, Houston Outlaws fans happy, and I hope I am gonna... gonna make them happy. I am gonna make them happy because I've rated them higher than their individual skills should suggest, given the competition this season. I'm rating them at number fifteen. Uh, I think the Houston Outlaws really are quite a one-dimensional team. I think the style of their tanks, in particular, uh, is quite one-dimensional, and I think it worked very well at the beginning of 2018. I was high on Muma. I thought he was playing a very intelligent style. But the more that we trended into dive meta, rather than being very flanky with like an anti-dive kind of style that Houston always used to play, the, the more that the, their coordination just completely went out the window. And so I feel if they're not able to correct that, they are going off of the advantage of experience and just being able to play as a team better than a lot of these rosters. If you ranked the support lines in OWL, Raucus and Banny and Boink would be almost at the bottom. Like, if you're being genuinely honest, even the Houston Ooh. fans, how do you rank them over a lot of these new uh, support lines that have been brought into the league? And then if you think, as I do, that perhaps Muma isn't this kind of all-star that we thought he was at the beginning of 2018, where he's able to manage a lot of different roles on Winston and also has a good Ryan. He does actually have a decent Ryan, to be fair, as well. And he has a good Winston as long as the meta fits him. <clears throat> but if you believe that, 
then that's a tank line and a support line that really aren't that good compared to the rest of the league. And then you have DPS problems that you've had all season long that I hope they've tried to fix coming into next season. So if it's a tank meta, it's probably better for this team, something that requires a bit more coordination. But if we get back to dive and stuff, Houston Outlaws are going to be really struggling, I think. I think we mostly agree. I think on average we we agree with that assessment. Yeah. We're not gonna yeah. we're not gonna jump on on it too much here because we have so many more to go. Let's go to number fourteen, uh, Josh. Number fourteen, I've got the Shanghai Dragons, mm. and this might be low for some people because they're oh, looking at Kongdu Panthera and they're looking at like how uh, how well they did in Contenders Korea. But this isn't Condu Panthera, and this isn't that meta. I think they've got some issues at off-tank. I think they had worse issues at off-tank when they were playing in Condu Panthera. They had Ding playing it, and that was just... Why? <laughs> they were just... I don't know. They played Brigitte half yeah. the time. So yeah. God knows how they made that work, honestly. Credit to their coaching staff and credit to their team for being able to, being able to make that work. But the Shanghai Dragons have now got Guardian, who is not that great. And uh, Giga, who's okay, but given the other off tanks that have come into the league, now is starting to slip down the table. I previously only had her at maybe out of the 12th, maybe like, say, say like the 12th starting uh, off tanks, I probably sure. had her at something like 7th or 8th. I think she starts to slip down the table as well. Fearless, I'm not sure how well he's going to work. I previously rated him pretty high in 2017, but who knows what's happened to him. And then they've also got some uh, holes in their support line and their DPS as well. Their support line, I think, is okay, but I don't think it was ever going to carry them. And I think if you're looking for a mid-table position, then they are mid-table supports. And I think their support line is strange. Ding is an excellent farer, but he doesn't have much else. Young Jin doesn't have much apart from Brigitte and sometimes isn't that great on Brigitte. DM's a talent, but he's just spent the last year styling on Pacific people. And I don't really know how good he is. And Dia speaks Chinese, so good luck to him. So the Shanghai Dragons, I think, are existing on a lot of hype because they're better than the previous Shanghai Dragons without a shadow of a doubt, but worse than the Kongdu Panthera that preceded them. Pretty much, and I, I can't. can't. And, I, and I can't put even the new teams that have been formed, like Charge, Defiant, and Spark, I can't put any of these teams beneath them as well. I think they've done a better job of being able to take other talent and piece them together than what I would expect from Dragons. All right, guys. Uh, Joe, Yiska, you're smarter than me. All three of us put Charge below the Dragons. I think Charge on paper can be another one of those like fusion university or atlanta rain style teams where they just kind of outskill you they'll just bulldoze you in some matches but when i look at shanghai and i see gaguri i see fearless yeah i i've kind of given them the benefit of the doubt and saying last year's team was an absolute dumpster fire right it's hard for me just to evaluate you accuracy right an absolute mess of a season it's hard for me to accurately kind of take a, a snapshot of you and then, you know, transition that in the next season and say, you know, that's the level that we should expect from you. Um, I, I'm kind of looking for them to kind of be the um, the spearhead for this team. Yes, they've added some players that I've never been too fond of, namely Luffy and Coma. You know, they've, they've just been fine for a lot of the time. I think this team is fine. I think it's if they are going to do well, it's not a lot of intangibles. It's it's in, you know, coming together as a team and, and being that team's team. It's a lot about Giggery and Fearless. I, I think Dia actually might have to see play. Um, it's going to be weird, but uh, I'm a little bit more uh, bullish on them. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest difference, I guess, to your evaluation is I think unless, and I, I, that might be a real possibility this season where the flex team player has to learn to play DPS in order to fit a system, maybe we get triple sure, DPS sure. matters or whatever. In that case, Hotbar probably becomes a serviceable player. Mm. Man alive are people high on way too high for him on him for my liking. I thought like every match he played as like as a fusion fan, you must have felt, okay, why not Poco here? Like, okay, so the saddle yeah. 
Hotba experiment, like uh, naturally because they were out for so, or Sato was out for so long, you thought, okay, these guys just are practicing with with each other the entire time, and then once Sato can play, they have the sickest synergy. Never happened. Really un uh, underwhelming diva performances for me. Um, and I don't think that he should be a, f a first liner for um, an Overwatch League team with aspirations. So yeah, that for me is a bit of a weakness. And Rio, yeah, I, I have questions about their tank line, I think, in comparison. Mm. So if I was to advocate for the Guangzhou charge, because at the beginning of the se uh no, not the beginning of the season, but we did an owl preview show. And I think I think I even said at the time that I thought the Guangzhou charge on paper looked like a catastrophe of a team. Um, they are speaking three completely different languages, Mandarin, uh, Korean, and uh, English with uh, Kib and Nero. And they had some players that I was really unfamiliar with um, and only a couple that I was familiar with. But the more that I've looked into this team, the more confident I feel about the, uh, the, the charge. And so if you compare them to a team like the Dragons, I think their backline is a lot better. I think that either... Rise, mm -hmm. previously Wanjo Lee, or Shu, who's been playing for the Toronto Esports, uh, good Zenyatta players. And I think Char yeah. is a, a decent um, main support as well. I think their backline's actually pretty good. Yeah. I think their tank line is, is probably going to be mid-table to slightly underneath, and which is about the rank that I have them as well. I think Rio is a fairly competent, safe main tank. And then I think uh, Hopper is okay on the off tank. And then uh, Happy is an absolute beast. Yes. Happy is a nut. And then Eileen, if they manage to integrate the Chinese players, is very good as well. Very aggressive, but very good. And then Kib and Nero also have a lot of potential. These are guys that you could really put a bit of stock in. Now, the communication issue was the big thing for me because I looked at this team and I thought, this is Shanghai Dragons all over again. This team is going to be terrible. They have to speak three languages. What are they thinking? Why are they doing this? Metabellum apparently were taking English lessons the entire time that they were playing in that team. So they can actually speak good English. We saw them in the, uh, in the show match they played against Seoul. They actually look like they have reasonable synergy together already. Yeah. This is not a disaster of a team, I think. And I previously thought that it was. So I'm much higher on the charge. I think Happy can do big work for this team. I think the backline are going to be quite strong, honestly, when you compare them to everybody else. And I think they've got players that they can really like lean on in the future. Like Nero can honestly be pretty good. I think Eileen can be pretty good if they integrate him. Kid plays a lot of these weird roles very well. The Hog, the Brigitte, he can occasionally play Genji for them if Eileen can't. I think Rio is going to be stable. The only question mark is Hotba, and we've expected him to be good or very good from last season because he was playing on Philly. He only has to be good now, so I think that he can manage that. So I'm a bit higher on the charge, and surprisingly for me, I'm higher on the charge than I am on the Defiant, weirdly, uh, even though I looked at the Defiant first of all and thought that they were good. So just to clarify for any viewers who are uh, listening, I've got Toronto Defiant at 13 and Charge at 12. So I've actually got the charge slightly higher. I was just talking about them because that's uh, the opposite of the Dragon's pick for everybody else. Mm. And that was the last time Sideshow was ever able to access winstonslab.com. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically, Baroy not happy about that one, uh, I'm sure. He does put, so you do put, with, with this, you put the... Um, Sorry, the Toronto Defiant uh, lower than the rest of us. Hmm. Yes. Uh, by a little I, bit, but, but only think... by a couple spaces, and that's okay. Yeah, I think they're going to be a good team. I think there's just too many unknowns to be able to rate them like fairly that high. I think they've got good pieces. They just rely on all of their scouting working really well. And I'm worried about their second DPS as well. I think Ivy's good. I, I'm... I've been talking with Dream a lot, and uh, Dream's mega high on this guy. I don't think I've watched as much of his VODs as uh, Dream has, certainly, but I think Ivy's going to be good. I don't know whether he's going to be like a world-class player at the end of 2019. We'll, we'll have to see. But I don't think that Stellar or Asher are really going to be great DPS partners for him, so I don't know whether this DPS line is really going to be able to be like great for the Toronto Defiant. Um, a good thing for the Defiant is that their coaching staff, in general, it seems, doesn't really believe that um, that 
the Toronto Defiant needs to be carried by their DPS. Even though IVs are nuts, they would be perfectly happy, I think, with Stellar Russia just being competent because they want Yakpung and Envy to be the carries. Uh, I haven't seen that personally from Yakpung. I'm just kind of believing in their coaching staff. But that's why I had to put them lower. Is just I, I have seen a lot of mistakes from Envy when I was watching last season of the Overwatch League. He's incredibly aggressive, and he followed Fate around and was very competent when they were having set plays and when he was following Fate around. When you leave that boy to do his own thing, he will quite often feed. And the problem with Overwatch is... If you feed on defense, you are going to lose a fight that's so crucial. It doesn't matter how many times you won. So I think a player that is uh, that has a propensity to sometimes make major mistakes, but otherwise plays pretty well, or even well, or like is actually a good player, just sometimes makes quite large mistakes, like Envy, in my opinion, is something of a detriment to the tank line. Now, whether they can iron that out, is up to the coaching staff of the Toronto Defiant. We'll see. And Yakpunning and Envy could be a very good offensive tank line. Um, and then Neko is very good. But also another reason that I have Toronto Defiant this low is that Neko is out for the first three games. And that's more than 10% of your season that you've missed. Probably your best player on the team, unless you think Ivy's going to outperform Neko. Neko was a top three Zen last season. I think he's very good. I think this team is built around, or isn't built around, but is relying on Neko to be great. And they've got a like expect aid or rocky to fill in that zen position it's going to be is going to happen so i i think these are three winnable games at the beginning of the season that neko is not going to be there for i think that really hurts them that's fair yeah we got to move we got to move because we're already 10 minutes over time we're gonna we're gonna keep this episode okay, in two hours run. i promise you guys i promise you we're gonna, give gonna you a little, we're gonna give you a little extra so Number 13, Toronto Defiant. Number 12, uh, Guangzhou Charge. Do you feel like you need to add anything to Guangzhou here? You, he's, he's spent a good No, I don't think so. No, no. All right. Number 11, then. Boston Uprising fans. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm stealing your thunder here. Boston Uprising fans, you're missing playoffs by one. Uh, just kidding. So, so, Sideshow, tell me about Boston. Number 11, the rest of us. So, you are significantly more high on Boston than we yeah. are. It's a pretty uh, big Yiska and yeah. myself. At seventeen, Joe at nineteen. Yes, and you discussed I think this, this a little is... bit about the core staying there, uh, Gamsu yeah. and Note. Uh, but, but tell us a little bit more one more time for those who forgot, because it was like forty-five minutes ago. If anyone forgot, I think the core of this team is very good. They've got four good players. They got Gamsu and Note, who were a very capable tank line from previously. I think Aim God was potentially even better than Neko, and we'll see whether that potential gets. Unleash next season. I think Kellex is a good role player within the system that they've established. Uh, I don't agree with the people that say that he's just like an outrageous feeder, even though I know a number of people do hold that opinion. Uh, I think he plays his role fairly well. Uh, he just has a disposable role with the way that they played very aggressively. And it just comes down to the DPS and, and coaches, whether or not you believe in Gumba instead of Krusty, and whether or not you believe in their DPS line. Like I even I tweeted as well that I would put them above my next pick, Soul Dynasty, if they pick up a really competent hitscan DPS as well. If they picked up somebody like Climax, and he didn't get a suspension, who knows what's going on there, um, and he was able to play these first few games where Color Hex can't, like, I would put them above Soul as well. I think this team is was previously fifth, outperformed everyone's expectations. I think they're going to do it again. I think they're still worse than they were last season compared to the competition. That's mm. why I've slipped them from fifth down to twelfth. Or possibly, uh, sorry, 11th or maybe 10th, but I don't think they're going to be as bad. Mm -hmm. I don't see. I just don't see it. I, I agree with you. You do. You do kind of sway me a little bit with uh, the stylistic difference between a lot of teams and the way that they play dive and Boston's kind of like 6-0 dive where they would have Calix join them um, very aggressively and he would, you know, it was expendable. So, you know, that, that does make a lot of sense. But I like no. I think Gamsu's fine. And then I look at the rest of the expansion teams. And I'm like, is that enough? I, I don't see it. I don't think that this team is is going to be as strong. I agree. I, I think that their tank line is the best part about that team, and it was middling, middling. Yeah. So to, to me, it isn't as outrageous of a statement simply because I think just with one argument, 
the differences in my ranking and Citrus ranking are easily justifiable, and it's simply how good is Krusty, and how good is the rest of the coaching stuff. And depending where you fall on that, of course, because of the articles we wrote, we have some insight into that structure. I tended to um, give Krusty possibly a little bit too much, but then again, we'll we will see how it turns out. Um, it. Uh, my understanding is that he was still like the strategical um, mastermind for that team and also at least with the competent players acting head coach. And now that there, he's not there anymore, I think there's a big hole to fill. And uh, yeah, we will see. We'll see. Boston up. We could probably do a whole episode about the Boston Uprising and and where to place them and and a lot because they're a really interesting team, right? There's a team that came into season one, very ranked very low, very mm-hmm. very ro- low. They didn't have uh, a lot of players that people were familiar with, and uh, their preseason power rankings really suffered from that. Season one, they blow away expectations, right? That's that's the idea. Is they blow away expectations. They finish, uh, whatever top five. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact listings, but but they finish really strong here, far above where most uh, sane analysts had placed them outside of people in the Boston Uprising organization. And then they get rid of uh, three quarters of their roster, including their uh, head, uh, Krusty, uh, head coach, not head coach, whatever. Now we come into season two, and it's a brand new thing, and we're looking down this barrel, the same exact barrel again. A bunch of players we don't really know or understand. Some analysts, I would say myself being one of them, saying I, I'm not a believer. I would say season one more of a fluke than season two more of an establishment. You know, season three, if they do the same thing in season one, season two, season three, no matter what they do, right? They got to be, they're going to be a top five team. They're just going to be. But until then, and that's a lot where my ranking sat is. I, I'm just not a believer. I don't believe that one season is enough to prove that a system works, especially when you go from 10 and 0 to 4 and 6 over one stage. I just don't, I don't know that we've had any other team that had fallen that far. NYXL, the closest, falling what from like 9 and 1 to 7 and 3 or something like that, from going from first mm. to, to middling. I just, I, 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 don't, I don't know. And so that, that's where, you know, I come from looking at that. I don't think it's there. Obviously, that's not the only thing that's being gauged by Yiska and Joe. Uh, but, you know, again, we talked about Krusty. We talked about that. Yeah. We're going to just do a whole Boston Uprising thing. We might have to. We'll, we'll, get, we'll just get, take... Let's get Shake on the show. I'll send, sure. I'll send Shake sure. a message and be like, Shake, come on the show. I don't I'm think, I, I, don't think I can get Huck, but, but I've talked to Shake a few times. I think we can maybe get Shake. Get Huck. I don't think so either. <laughs> I don't. I don't think so at all. We can't get Huck. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that that's gonna happen. But I would love, you know, I, I I do think that there's a lot of questions. There are. They're, they're shrouded in mystery in a lot of ways, right? And we we can speculate all you want. Some people are really optimistic. They did it season one. Why can't they do it season two? Other people are like, yeah, they did it season one, but it's just one season, and it's the first season when there's the most movement. There's a lot going on. Yeah, if if Huck comes out here and pulls off another playoff team with with kind of a budget roster, in, you'll have an article in my inbox, and uh, I I can't not ignore that. That's a, a huge storyline that you you can do this two seasons in a row, and you can now, at least for me, I feel safe in in you know kind of speaking to people and saying yes whatever you think about these players when you put them in this environment they tend to succeed whatever it is i don't know whatever the secret sauce is top five control whatever huck's got it works i just can't i can't see it with this roster with the lack of star power with a middling you know just roster overall i I don't personally see it but i'll be happy to to write that article post haste still got my boston uprising t-shirt and jersey in that closet right there still do doesn't mean I'm putting them top 10. Let's go to the top 10. Top I think it's 10. time. Top 10. Yep. Josh, number 10, who you got? I, I think you already said this already, but, but tell us who you got. Tell us why. All that good stuff. 
Number 10 is, for me, the Soul Dynasty. I think there are other teams that you could uh, have at 10 and rate the Soul Dynasty higher. But for me, even though this team has added a lot of good talent, like, for example, Fissure on the main tank fills a hole that was sorely uh, lacking for mm -hmm. them in 2018. Uh, Marvel as well fills that same hole, and so even if one of them sucks, even if one of them collapses, the other should be able to fill in. They've also got Jexa there as well, who I think is an excellent addition to the team. I'm really a big fan of his. I've been following Element Mystic for a while. He was their caller, kind of their, um, uh, the voice of their coaching game as well, as far as I know. I think these are great pickups for the Soul Dynasty. But much like the Florida Mayhem, they have some washed up has-beens on their team, in my opinion. And this pains me to say it. But I think that the players that they have kept, even though a lot of people will still highly rate them, will prove in 2019 to not be as good as people expect them to be. I think that the combo of Jaehong and Toby are very similar to Miro. I think they have innovated at their peak and have not kept up with the competition, particularly Jaehong. I think Toby, maybe, we don't really know whether he'd be a competent Lucio if that came back into the meta again, but I think Jaehong is past his prime. I think he, you know, people say that he was the, the core of the team in terms of, like, his calling or whatever, or was the uh, older brother figure or whatever. I, I've i never understood where these claims from came from, even from the beginning. I think it's just people making mad assumptions based on his age because he's the oldest person on the team. I don't think he fulfilled either of these roles. I think that other people at his position have massively outperformed him in 2018, will continue to in 2019, and I, I fear that the total collapse of the Soul Dynasty is incoming in 2019 because they haven't found a new core. They've taken their old core and tried to add pieces onto it. So let's go through the Soul Dynasty. Their support line, Jexa, I think, will always see playtime, unfortunately, for Toby. I'd like to see Toby traded elsewhere, in fact, because I think he might still have a future, but who knows. So I expect it to be Jexa and Jaehong. I don't think Jaehong's going to be the, the peak performer. Or I think he's going to be a mid-table performer, m maybe even at best, compared to some of these other new talents that have come up on his role that are more mechanically skilled and better at decision-making and better at keeping up with the meta. I think when it comes to the tanks, I think there's massive debate about who's even going to play. Do you want the added synergy of Marvel and Michelle, who are playing for uh, Lucky Future Zenith for all this time? Or do you want Fisher, who plays his one style and plays it very well, alongside Zunba, who we know can still be a very competent off-tank? And when it comes to the DPS, I mean, it's Fletter and who? It's Munchkin, who wasn't very good, did not live up to the hype in 2018, and Fitz, who... I don't know enough about, but because I don't know enough about him, I'm not anticipating big things coming from him. So Soul Dynasty have got stars in certain positions. Jexa, previously Jaehong, Fissure, Zunba, Fletter. These guys should be people that you know, but should be people that you know from the past, I think. I don't think people who are new to the scene are going to know them in the future. Fair enough. Joe, I see you want to say something. We do, we have limited time, so you better really want to say it. I I look at the the positives. I I do agree that you know, do you add a very one dimensional and possibly um kind of n nuclear ro like member to the roster that that could just collapse it and and just break it down or 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 even fight with Jexa when it comes to calling which was something that I kind of looked at but the, the as much as I don't like to use the term the upside if it does work right if you can kind yeah, of congeal can. this roster together yeah. is powerful you know it, yes. if there's a meta yeah. that does suit the backline um that that we can see Jay Hong return to his Ana which was arguably his better pick I think he could take a uh, a page from someone like Elk's notebook where because he is so strong on a pick that you could argue uh, optimal strategy, right? Is the Zen the right choice? I don't think so. I've never been high on his Zen. I have been high on his Ana. So you could argue that putting him on the Ana in terms of this these these strange compositions might net them a little bit more comfort, a little bit more success. Um, and then that's where I kind of bump them up, up uh, slightly a little bit. You know, we're coming in. There's going to be different metas. There's going to be changes abound, no doubt. 
Um, I, I, I see it working a little bit better, but if it does fail, I do kind of have them roughly where, where Sideshow has them at about 10th. I think they're, they're right at the cutoff a playoff team, but there's a good chance that they might be able to slip down if, if this roster just does not work. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's go on to number nine here. Number nine, unanimously, unanimously, unanimously. Dallas Fuel, number nine for us three. Let's see what Sideshow has. Number nine. Oh, man. I got the Hangzhou Spark. I think um, this is the best of the new expansion teams that's been created anew. I have the Vancouver Titans, who are a new expansion team above them, because it's Runaway, and I think they're going to be better. Um, but the Hangzhou Spark, I think, are going to be good. Now, I think perhaps I have them lower rated than other people. Um, uh, they have two mm -hmm. languages that they have to integrate. Gushui and Crystal, good players. Very, very good players from China. Would definitely be on any super team that you created from there. But they speak Mandarin. They don't speak Korean. So integrating, into the, integrating them into the team might be a bit of a challenge. Uh, apart from that, I think they have a good team that maybe lacks a little bit of punching in their DPS. Baziodora and Godsby, you've got some okay players. You don't really have anybody who's a beast apart from Crystal on the lineup. So you really have to integrate Crystal at that point, in my, in my opinion, to be able to get like higher up the table. So it comes down to how well they can integrate Gushui and Crystal. Those are two star players for them. If they're not able to do that, they're going to suffer and they're going to drop down. So I've got them somewhere in between where I think they'll be. All right. That's, that's pretty close to ours. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. not too far off. I look through them. Yeah. Yeah, really close. I had them a little bit lower. Uh, let's talk about number eight, though. Number eight is the Dallas Fuel. So this is where I've rated the Dallas Fuel. I previously had them quite a bit lower, actually. I think I had them somewhere around 10th because I'm still very worried for Dallas if a dive meta comes back. I don't think... I think... So... They've added two crucial people, uh, maybe maybe three. Closer, I don't view as as crucial, but I think he'll be a great role player for the team and be able to keep them all on the same page. I think he's an excellent player. I think he just didn't work for London. But the two people I'm most interested in are RCK and Zachary. RCK, I think, is a big upgrade on the off-tank position. I think Mickey was really poor towards the end of the season. He got a lot of hype for playing the Brigitte well, but he was playing a mad OP Brigitte, and he sucked on uh diva let's be reasonable here rck big upgrade that should be good for them the question is can zachary be a role player within a dive meta for the dallas fuel he only has to be a role player but he has to be at least competent as a role player and yeah. what we've seen from him so far is that this might not work for him he seems to be a little bit in his own head maybe underperforming in these big games I don't know how well it'll integrate into this team, so I'm still concerned for them when it gets to dive. We've never seen good dive play from Dallas Fuel, and it's been such a crucial component of Overwatch, you know, before Brigitte was released. If, they, if it's a tank team, if it's a tank meta, I think Dallas Fuel are going to be good. I think they've got good coaching that some people do overrate, though, um, and I think they're going to be a competent team. Do I think they're going to break the top five? No, because I worry about what's going to happen to them when they play dive. And I also just worry about this team in general with how their DPS work together. Yeah. Yep. Can agree Fair more. Enough. Pretty much the same. If they got a better flex DPS, I would be way higher on them. At least a, yes. a, a recently proven one. Yes, we've seen Zachary play projectile in the past. That is something that Dallas has needed since the, their days on Team Envious, but... You know, I'd like somebody with a little bit more reason. Fair enough. Let's go on to number seven. We're getting close. Number seven. Josh, who you got there? Number seven is the Vancouver Titans for me. I can't realistically put them any higher than this because at this point, we're now getting into what I consider the higher tiers of the teams. The top seven for me is fairly solidified. The bottom, you know, was mixed in the middle, mixed to the bottom. My top seven are fairly solid. I think the Vancouver Titans have proven themselves as Runaway to be a meta-proof team with great synergy that are going to be able to make big results. The question is whether or not they just come to LA and start taking, you know, Western uh, ridiculous... They've got all of this money now. Are they just going to spend it on beer and sit in their hot tub and enjoy themselves? I yeah. hope not. I hope they still keep their Korean dedication and that same culture within the team, despite changing the coaching staff and the management around them. 
uh, I have to put them underneath people like the two LA teams, beneath the shot, beneath the fusion, because they could be at that point or even lower because they don't have any owl experience or even living in North American experience. But I think they're a very good team. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree. I think that's like the, that's very much the same reasoning we cited in our episode yeah. when we evaluated the chart. Uh, sorry, the Titans. Yeah. I also don't think that Haxal and Stitch are as good as people give them credit no, for. No, not yeah. at all. No, I don't not think they're going to be the fair. Yeah, team. Yeah, totally but agree. they will probably still make it work. Yeah. I agree. All right, that was number seven. Number six, who you got, Josh? Number six, I got the LA Valiant. And I'm still a lot higher on this team than I think quite a number of people are. I do not think this team even has the potential to dip down into the mid table. I think they have worked on their fundamentals enough and kept their core solid enough to the point where any dip down would be so random. Like these dips in consistency are not what LA Valiant showed us in 2018. They showed us they are consistently a good team that you have to be like at your peak or playing much better Overwatch to be able to overcome. They finished uh, second in the overall season. They finished fourth in the, uh, in the playoffs. Yes, they've got a downgraded DPS and their coaches have disappeared, some of them, but they are still such a solid team that I don't understand how people can rate them any lower than like right around where the Gladiators, where the Titans, where the Fuel are. I think you're mad if you think the Valiant are going to be any worse than that, honestly. Joe, it, you're it mad. Sounds, Joe, it you're sounds mad. like there's a big uh, change in axioms for me specifically that... A, I haven't shown a lot of love to teams that have have just kind of uh, shed a lot of their good parts and haven't really retained anything. Yes, I do think that this is going to be your um, your, your stable roster like they were in season one, but I, I do think that the overall skill has increased and they have just remained the same. So for me, they they bopped down quite a considerable amount, and that's just that's just how I'm looking at the expansion teams, how people have added to their roster. I do think that the level has significant in significantly increased. Whereas the Valiant have arguably gotten worse for me. I think they've bled a lot of their good coaches. They've, they've lost gotten worse for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I they, mean, they just dropped four or five slots rather than ten. It will be interesting to see when the authority clamp works from both sides with Moon for the Koreans. And then, okay, now I don't know if that's released, but the, the Western guy from the, for the Western um, team, right? And because, once again, we know that Valiant, as basically every other team uh, in the Overwatch League, had some internal struggles there between their Western and uh, Korean players. So if, if they can, you know, focus that down, that might work very well. But yes, I also question where their stra uh, strategic coaching will come from. Maybe I just haven't paid close enough attention, but uh, losing... If I'm not mistaken, both Gamba and Demon, and Demon should have yes. should have heard a lot, right? In that regard, that is in theory, now true. Yeah. Yes, right. Exactly. So, in theory, um, but yeah, I mean, I also notice, like for me, this was just a placing of like, okay, I didn't clearly didn't understand something about Valiant. I know about what size that thing is. I will try to find out in season two what that thing is, but yeah. I will put it on the scale uh, and try to, you know, whatever it is, it, it has weight, and therefore, like, they have to be eye up. I, I don't think it's that, that crazy. I think they're just a fine team, and they've they've lost a lot of their role players. Again, soon, an incredible objective player. Now we have agility, a KSF, and potentially, you know, Kareev, I, I, Bunny, you, you play Tracer. I liked you when you were on BK Stars, homie. What are you doing now? I don't. It, it's so middling to me. I think they're fine. Maybe, I think they're maybe perfectly fine. Maybe it's because everyone is toxic. And you know that particle that nobody found out. The Higgs boson. Maybe they have, maybe they have the Tox boson. Uh, and that's the, the thing we know about. Find out about Overwatch, <laughs> like how it works. Unbelievable. I, there I we just go. Don't we got our yiskism. Yiskism. <laughs> yeah, we got that in there for one. We got to go. We got to keep going. Number four or number five. Sorry, we're in the top five now. Josh, yep. this is important. 
my top five, uh, my fifth team is the LA Gladiators. And as we alluded to earlier, I'm not sure quite how the LA Gladiators snuck into this position, but I give them more credit than the teams below them and yep. less credit than the teams above them. Therefore, yeah. they have to be there in this position. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. I think... David, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're all in agreement here. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. You're be I will yeah. not temper my f expectations. Yeah. yeah. I Top think the fiber, system works. I sell all my gladiator stuff. The system works. They integrated Decay, and I think Decay and Shofar could be a really good DPS duo. I think Roar is a good replacement for Fisher, though I don't expect him to be like a beast. But it does open them up to different play styles, and I think exactly. their coaching has been okay. I don't see this team getting worse compared to the competition, and they could potentially improve. I think they haven't got like, I think the Valiant slipped a little bit, and the Gladiators remained this roughly the same, maybe a slight increase. So I think I've got to put them in five. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Let's let's go it's... to number four. I think this is actually going to be a really good one to discuss. Number four, who you've got there, Sideshow? Number four is the San Francisco Shock for me. And I know we're all high on the San Francisco Shock, and I think there's very good reason to be high. They've made fantastic upgrades across the board. They've got their checkbook, and they've just found somebody like the, all of their big people that they had in that opening video that sponsored the team and stuff, and they've just passed around a checkbook, and people have been just putting their signatures on the line. They've made outrageous improvements from last season. They said coming into the league, season two is our season, and they've made the the acquirements that they need. Crusty, great, uh, enormous upgrades like striker, for example. The only um, position that's perhaps poor is a super and smurf on main tank, but I think they're going to be able to more than make up for that. The only problem is they are unproven and may fall into the same trap that we've seen from other teams where they try and give everybody the same uh -huh. kind of time playing. I hope, I hope they're ruthless with it. I hope they just say you guys are rubbish. Sit on the bench. Please keep the pine warm. And these guys are just going to sit there and collect their checks. And if they don't, if they raise a ruckus, like perhaps we've seen from Rascal in the past where he was removed from the uh, the London Spitfire, or, or you know maybe Baby Bay or Sinatra or somebody that's not getting as much time is really uh, causing discord within the team, I hope that they are ruthless enough to be able to get rid of whatever players they do put on the bench, even if that ends up being somebody like Stryker. Yes. I hope that they don't allow this internal discord to m ruin what could be a fantastic team yeah. that has the potential to win the season. Yep, but yep. I can only put them in fourth because they're so unproven. Like yep. We are putting so much Thank stock you. into their on-paper ability. Yeah. That's yeah. so why I couldn't put them in top three, Josh. I just couldn't. Sure. I just, there's something special about that top three. I couldn't put them in, but I could also see them winning everything. Yes. They're yeah. really good. I They're agree. really good. All right. Give us your top three then. Let's go. All right. Top three. Number three. You know, it's my boys. Philadelphia Fusion. And I have been high on this team for quite a while. Yeah. I think this was another refute this episode where I said that they yeah. have the highest individual skill in the season. And but I'm not just a fanboy. I've got I think that I have reasonable reasons why I would expect Philadelphia Fusion to still be one of the top 3 teams coming into next season. And here uh, my I completely recognize that the Philadelphia Fusion had mad inconsistency squ uh, swings in 2018. They had ridiculous lows and honestly some ridiculous highs as well. But the point is being able to level that out and continue what they uh, ended on. Some positives for that, though. They have Sado for the entirety of 2019, which they did not have in 2018. They were forced to play with Fraggy and this weird mm -hmm. juggle between their A team and their B team, but they knew that their B team had components they wanted to move into their A team. I think really messed with the practice that they were able to have and messed with the idea of creating a consistent core. So I think having Sado in there will be a big boon for them. I think also the fact that they have that experience from 2018 will help them. These are mental problems that this team has been through. I talked to the players after some of these losses and they know what happened. They got mad tilted after they lost to some of these teams and it ruined the rest of their games. The fact that there is a more uh, tempered approach to the matches where you only have one, sometimes mm. zero, sometimes two games a week, I think will play into Fusion's favor and I think mm. will help towards this consistency. Mm. 
I definitely don't think we'll see the same inconsistency that we did in season one. Mm. We may still see an inconsistent team because they play a chaotic style centered around their DPS, but I do not think we'll see them like going five maps against a team that didn't no. win any games. That is just insane. And I think that is an outlier that we shouldn't expect from Philadelphia Fusion in 2019. I do think that they'll be able to outperform teams like the Gladiators, maybe the San Francisco Shock, uh, but just based on the fact that this team pound for pound is unreal and they have the experience now and know how their team works. Yeah. Fair. Also, they they will probably be uh, more consistent because they don't have a poltergeist in their treehouse outside asking people <laughs> in the middle of the night for a game of chess or more food. Oh, that, was not, that was not my fault. We can't blame me for uh, going five maps against Shanghai. Listen, all I'm saying is... <laughs> Don't, don't look at my betting records. I may have placed a bet on Shanghai in that game. You yeah, know what I mean? <laughs> didn't we all? Uh, we, we all did. Everybody did that. Here's the thing. This is the important thing. It's all coming down to this. London, NYXL, all that's left. I'm not going to ask for your number two. I'm going to ask for your number one because this is hotly contested. We had Yiska and Joe put NYXL as number one. I had put Spitfire. As number two, so you have to decide which big brain John? you want to decide on. John, what do I always say? I always say you've got the wrinkly brain of a giant walnut inside your cranium. <laughs> I always say you have got just the most incredibly wrinkled cranium I've ever seen in my life. Now, I'm going to go with the London Spitfire here, and I think that it's really a toss-up between the two of them. But the reason that I'm going with London is that I think the... The London Spitfire had the team that was able to reach the highest peaks throughout the season. And there were limiting factors as to why they oh. did not reach those peaks. And those limiting factors were a lot of dissension within their team, which they have completely removed, as in they've cut all the players that were poor and removed that internal conflict. And also a theory that I have as well is when you look at the playoffs and you see the difference between Badoshin and Klosa playing together, two players that are known to have very decisive personalities and call a lot within the team when they remove one of them the one that's less mechanically skilled that would be closer and they bring in nuss and they rely on badoshin's shot calling and actually have a system that they can work with they excelled and the difference between one game and the other was night and day and so i think that this diff this complete removal of the internal conflict is going to go a long way to improving the london spitfire and when you consider how good they were, even with all of these crazy highs and lows in the regular season, I think as long as they remove some of the lows, the London Spitfire should be what you consider your defending champions for 2019. They've also got a really talented main coach, uh, like Coach 815, who I put quite a bit of stock in, or even though I have really not been involved in any of the games that he's coached in the past. I just think they have an insane roster. Gesture Fury has come on a huge amount. I think Gesture and Fury, easily the best tank line in the league. I think Profit's the best individual player. I think they've got a very good support line as well. I'm interested to see what Krillin can do and what Guard can add to the team. I think this is the team to beat in 2019. Uh, You're correct. Did you did you hear the the attentive refute this listener mm -hmm. will have heard that he gave in and said that london had the highest potential peaks in the overwatch league season one you hear that uh, uh. <laughs> do you know what i'll give you that one i'll give you that i want all the rest <laughs> I want all <laughs> yes one you, you won jonak yes you won jonak <laughs> i give you that much and then excel I won everything I, about NYXL. Uh, NYXL you did as well, yeah. So, but are you going to predict Krillin to be the next Jonak? No. No, I am not going to predict Krillin. <laughs> oh, I, oh, he didn't oh, take the bait. I think, he didn't I think take he'll the be bank. good, though. Yeah. I think the weird thing is, like, any team that's at that kind of level that picks up some random guy from the ladder has to have acknowledged yeah. some ridiculous talent. Like, mm. you can't just think that they've picked up some... When you look at the Washington Justice, like, yeah, you can think they just picked up scrubs because either they don't have the money or they don't have the skill to be able to scout. But when you look at London and everybody else have scouted and then they pick up some random, you've got to give them a bit of credit. Like, they must have seen yeah. something in trials. It's reasonable even without any empirical evidence to give them the benefit of the doubt in that context. Like. But I don't sure. think he's going to be the next Jonah. I think Bedosin will stay there because he's the caller as well. So if anything, I can see him replacing Nuss, actually, because he used to play a bit of Mercy. 
This this is the man that won the Powerball 350 million and isn't investing it in more lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I got away with it. Hey. Double, okay. double it. Let's go. Yeah. All right, we got to get out of here. There it is. Your top 20 sideshow. Uh, your 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 power rankings. So yeah. It was it was it was magical. It was amazing. It was great. Here's the thing, though. We are tied for Spitfire is number one, NYXL is number two. So it means that D-Pay, when you come on the show next week, you're going to have to tell us, you're going to have to pick one over the other who you think the best one is. I know you work for the class. It's a tiebreaker. I don't even care. You're tie-breaking. You're tie-breaking next week. So make sure to tune in for that. Next week, D-Pay, head coach of the LA Gladiators, is going to be on the show with us. Joe, you're going to be gone. Yes, you're gone the next two weeks. Yep, yep. I've got a got a got a got a plane to catch. Fair enough. I get it. You got got to live that uh, first class Overwatch reporter whoa, life. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Flying, flying Delta business class all the way. Sideshow. <laughs> I don't know what Sideshow's doing. He's just well, rubbing, you and your rubbing the, have mic. the same haircut. <laughs> I think he may have unplugged his headset. I, I mean, there's definitely noise coming from that. Sorry, audio listeners. There's nothing I can do about that, but I don't even care. It's kind of nice. Apologies. It's soothing. <laughs> it's soothing. soothing. That's what I was going for. It is soothing. It is nice. Oh, man. So, Sideshow, I, I, I got to thank you again for being on the show. Uh, really quickly, Where? Wh- what are you up? what are you up to these days? What am I up to? Uh, I've recently been posting some keys to victory for the all of the Overwatch League teams on owl.com. So if you're interested, um, even the ones that I don't think will do that well, I've been noting the positives for them. So if you're a fan of any of the teams that I rated uh, low in terms of my power rankings, you can jump on the overwatchleague.com over the next couple of weeks before the season begins. And you can find out the uh, silver linings that I believe or the stuff that they have to work on, the challenges that they'll face. Uh, so the stuff that you can tweet about or look forward to over the season. There you have it right there. Make make sure to follow Sideshow at Sideshow Gaming on Twitter and everywhere else. He's everywhere. I'm sure this won't the last won't be the last time that you'll have him on Tactical Crouch or Overwatch League Daily or whatever we end up deciding to do. Follow Yiska at Yiska Out. Check that next thinking it over because I'm sure it'll be spicy at Volumel. At Volumel. And myself at Kick Tripod. Thank you all for tuning in for this episode. We're going to get out of here. We're going to see you next week with D Pay. See you guys. Bye.